from inside the warehouse at Oriel Park at Camden Yards, it is the Masson All Access Podcast brought to you by Toyota. For legendary safety and reliability, choose Toyota and let's go places. Paul Mancano and Brendan Mortensen here with you. Brendan, coming off an intramural basketball game, you yeah. not I. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, I heard it was a loss. It was. It should not have been. We were up like 15 points at halftime. We were playing... Good defense. We were making shots in the second half. We did not make shots. Oh. We did not play good defense. It was how not good. How many points did you score? I only had five points. I didn't take many shots. It's oh. also not a very high scoring game. I think the game ended in like the forties. You go for both teams. Do you go ones and twos or do you go? Twos no, and it's threes? twos and threes. But okay. it's it's twenty minute halves and the clock doesn't stop at all in the first half. Oh, and the clock only fouls. stops right. And the clock only stops with two minutes left in the second half. It sounds like you need extra time. Yeah, I mean, the, it would be nice. You should have somebody come out with a giant board that says right eight. Eight a known soccer minutes. lover paul mancano uh, no no you know how much i love soccer yeah i sure do uh brendan i watched nope the other day about six months late sure yeah i mean probably more than that uh, more than that it was it honest. was like a big summer blockbuster it was it, great it was the Excellent. jordan peele movie yep and uh i'm watching it uh on one of the streaming services can't remember which one and there are green flickers as the movie is going along flashing Every, I don't know, 10 minutes or so. But Just here's the thing. For a split second. There's not. But continue. So I'm watching it, and then I'm thinking, boy, this is some genius stroke by Jordan Peele here to get us to maybe realize that we're watching a movie to purposely take us out of it. Because so much of the movie is about movies and about detaching yourself from the film. And I'm thinking, this is a master stroke. And I'm, I, I should go back and watch the entire movie and take note of when those green flickers are and, and try to determine exactly how important they are to the plot. And then I come back and I say, Brendan, I just watched Nope. What do you think that those green flickers meant in the middle of that movie? And you said, what green flickers? Yeah. And then I Googled it and I couldn't find anything. I just think it was really funny that, I mean, that's kind of how Jordan Peele movies are. Like you watch a Jordan Peele movie and you're like, wow, I gotta, I gotta analyze this. You I gotta break this down. Everything is such an artistic choice with Jordan Peele because he's an excellent director, excellent writer. And it's just really funny that you came back and were like, wow, I mean, what did you think of this particular choice? And it just, it didn't exist. It wasn't a choice. No. It, uh, the choice was that you need a new television. Yeah, I think that's, or I need a, a better internet connection. Right. I mean, that was very disappointing. Yeah. Really thought that I was going to find uh, some deeper meaning there. Ruined the movie for you. Akin to when we watched Tenet and uh, we were just baffled. Utterly baffled. I'm still baffled. If anybody knows <laughs> how Tenet was supposed to be viewed and how you were supposed to understand it, please, please let us know. Now, what if we watched that movie on re reverse? What if we watched it backwards? Would we understand Tenet better? I still like my theory that Christopher Nolan is coming out with a trilogy and that was the last movie of the trilogy. And that was going back first. in time. And he's going yes. back to, because Oppenheimer right. is the movie that takes place. Yeah around World War II. Yeah. Wow. Well, if you know the solution to Tenet, please comment below. And if you don't like movies, sorry for the first three minutes of this podcast. I'm not apologizing. Nope. Well, I did. Nope. At least one of us is nice. No. Uh, it's not you. All right, Brendan. It's time to review the results. No, it's the not. The all-future Orioles draft. Don't think so. We drafted the best players for the year 2025. You, me, and our good friend Tim Leonard... In a two-part podcast, if you haven't heard it or watched it, please go back and do so. And uh, I left that podcast feeling as good as I had about any of the drafts that Me we too. had on the Mass and All Access podcast. I will say the voting was closer than it had ever been. And uh, I think we're probably still waiting for a few mail-in ballots, but I think we can confidently project that Tim Leonard has won the all-future Orioles draft. Yeah, we are cursed. We will never win a fantasy draft. Yeah. Every We have now had three fantasy drafts over the last three years yep. with guests Tim Leonard and Connor Newcomb. All Earl Weaver draft, yep. all Camden Yards draft. This is the final piece of our Christopher Nolan tri trilogy. Yeah, and we have never won. It has always been either Tim or Connor. And you would think... Because we comprise two-thirds of those drafts. That there would be a solid <laughs> chance that we win. <laughs> that one of us would win. Doesn't happen. Tim finished with 138 votes between Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, and Instagram. We each finished with 116. So we don't yep. even get bragging rights over each other. I mean, I won the Twitter vote. That's that's, that's the only platform. thing I can take home to the bank. I, 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 
appreciate the Twitter vote. And That's I, it. I won the YouTube vote. Tim destroyed us on Instagram. I think it's the bots. I don't know what was going on on Instagram, I but it, I got like two votes on Instagram yeah. and I won Twitter. I, I don't know what was going on. He had 37 Instagram comments. I had 10, you had seven. Yeah. I don't understand I how that he, happened. I think it was bots. Because he my came in last on Twitter. And I, I'm going to be honest. He came in last in my mind. He had the worst team. I'm going to be totally honest about by that. By far the worst Tim team. Tim knows. Yeah. This is not a shock not to Tim even, Leonard if he listens to this podcast. He had the worst team. Not even Tim felt confident about no, his draft. He afterwards. left the draft and went, ah, my team kind of stinks. Yep. And it did a little bit, Tim. <laughs> and yet, it kind of stunk. And yet, he won. Yeah. Deeply upsetting. Well, thank you yeah. for voting anyway, and if you didn't vote for me, you're dead to me. Uh, Brendan, time for a free agency bracket update. Yep. We're starting with all the niche jokes that really, if you haven't heard the Mass on All niche. Action. Niche? 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 You say you're a niche guy, not a niche guy. I go back guy. and forth. It's like pecan, pecan. Oh, pecan. don't get started on this. I mean, which which way do you say it? I think I say niche more than I say pecan. The thing is, I don't say niche enough. So that when I... But you say it more than PK. When I'm talking and I'm ap- approaching the word in a sentence, I get nervous and I start I to think do about double, it. Yeah, I yeah. think about it. So I think niche, uh, n- niche, uh, niche, uh, you know. So niche. I struggle with it. Niche. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, we're starting with all the inside jokes here. So <laughs> if you haven't gone back, if you're a new listener to the... Now I'd like to apologize podcast, for the first eight minutes of this podcast. Yeah, we're going to just... By the 46th minute, we're still apologizing. Yeah. Uh, the free agency bracket... Has taken a lot of hits yeah. recently. Still not good. Our entire starting pitching region has been knocked out. Yep. And now our entire big bat region has been knocked out. The most recent signing was Trey Mancini signing with the Chicago Cubs to uh, back up or to supplant Eric Hosmer, who also signed with the Chicago Cubs. They Potential a, platoon, they, probably. Yeah, they signed a lefty first baseman and a righty first baseman. Yeah. So they have a nice little first baseman tandem. In Chicago, Brandon Belt signed with Toronto, one year, $9.3 million, so he is off the board. Brandon, I think when you look at this big board, there's you could expand it further into guys that we didn't include on the free agency bracket that are still out there. I'm not enticed with really anybody left in the free agent market. The only guy that I think still would present a sizable upgrade for the Orioles, pitching-wise, infield-wise, big bat-wise, would be Michael Waka. That's the only guy I think left that would really be an upgrade. The the free agency market has been depleted. Yeah, nobody on this bracket that would make any sort of sense no. for the Orioles because you have some middle infielders like Josh Harrison and Donovan Solano who are still on the board. I don't think either of them make any logical sense to plug up the middle infield more with a potential depth utility guy like Harrison and Solano both profile as. And the Orioles won't be getting, presumably, a backup catcher because they brought one in in James McCann. So yeah. bringing in somebody like Gary Sanchez would not make any sort of sense. But you're right. Michael Waka was not on that free agency bracket. He's probably the only starting pitcher free agent left available that I think would make sense for the Orioles. I have made my case a few times on this podcast that I don't think it makes any sense to bring in a back end of the rotation kind of starter at this point. If you're doing that, I would, quite frankly, just rather see somebody like D.L. Hall earn a rotation spot than a back end of the rotation starter in free agency. But if you truly believe that Michael Waka can be the kind of pitcher that we saw last year with the much improved numbers from the previous few seasons, then he would make sense and would profile as a number two or a number three. I think Zach Greinke, who I believe is still out there, might also make a, lot, a little bit of sense for the Orioles. Yeah. He wouldn't be a sizable upgrade for what they have, but he could provide some depth and could maybe be a 2-3 starter. And maybe you give him the ball on opening day because he's a Cy Young caliber pitcher, or, or was at least, at the peak of his career. And might be a nice veteran presence if you are able to entice him to come to Baltimore. But other than that, there's really not many options out there. And now that Brandon Belt, Trey Mancini, those guys are off the board, Eric Hosmer... That represents the last of the backup first baseman or really corner outfield options that the Orioles could have gone after. Now, they did get some good news, though, in the first baseman market. That they did. And that would be Lewin Diaz. (laughs) The gamble, as you tweeted, Brendan, at Brendan Morty, paid off for Michael Elias. It only took two or three tries. 
But Lewin Diaz has cleared waivers. Yeah, a lot of people were asking about Lewin Diaz and about Ryan O'Hearn why you would trade for guys and then designate them for assignment. The hope there is that you trade for them because you want them in the organization, not necessarily because you want them to have a guaranteed roster spot at the major league level. They wanted O'Hearn. They wanted Diaz. They wanted to be able to pass them through waivers. Ryan O'Hearn, a lot easier to do that. Another team did not place a claim on him when he was designated for assignment. So he's at AAA Norfolk. And now Lewin Diaz, after a whole offseason saga of getting claimed and traded and DFA'd, he finally seems to be settled. He will be heading to AAA Norfolk. That's where he was assigned. And the Orioles have what Michael Elias wanted all along, which was both of these guys in the organization with a chance to go to spring training and potentially earn an opening day roster spot. Whether or not they're able to do that, because it's a very crowded bench, as we will probably talk about on a future podcast, we'll see if they're able to do that, but at least you have the options now. I'd like to formally refer to the 40th spot on the 40-man roster as the Lewin Diaz station. I like I think it. that he's earned that designation. Yeah. Because he is in a unique spot in the baseball universe where he is too good to be picked up over and over again and claimed over and over again, but he's not good enough to be the first one DFA'd when somebody better comes along. Yeah, it's tough because a lot of people have kind of been poking fun at the whole Lane Diaz situation. But the thing is, if he was worse at baseball, this wouldn't be happening. Yeah. Because he wouldn't be claimed by other teams when he was designated for assignment. He would just do what ended up happening in Baltimore, which was probably accepting a minor league assignment and just going there. But it's because he's good enough that other teams want him that he kept getting claimed and DFA'd and moved all around. So nice that Lewin Diaz is finally seemingly settled a little bit, and now he is going to be competing for an opening day roster spot with the Orioles. So when you talk about what that roster spot means for the Orioles, assuming that it's going to be a 26-man roster and no more changes are made over the next couple of months where they bump it down to 25 or bump it up to 27, that means it's 13 pitchers, 13 position players, when you're filling out the Orioles' 26-man roster position players and you're filling those 13 spots, you're talking about the starting nine. Let's say we stick Adam Frazier at second. We could make Ramon Arias your DH. So that's nine guys that are locked in are going to make the team. You need the 10th guy to be your backup catcher. That's going to be James McCann. Then you've got three roster spots, and you've got Ryan McKenna, Taryn Vavra, Kyle Stowers as three guys who could fill those three spots. Do the Orioles even have room on the 26-man roster for Lewin Diaz or Ryan O'Hearn or Franchi Cordero? Not really, unless you want to make the case that you would rather have Taron Vavra getting every day at bats at AAA or Kyle Stowers getting every day at bats at AAA. But then again, that falls into the argument of what else do they need to do to prove that they are good enough players to be at the major league level. This is just the Ryan McKenna conversation from a year ago yeah. where he would get every day at bats with AAA Norfolk, have like a 950 OPS for a few weeks, and then it was like, okay, he clearly doesn't need to be here. Same with Tyler Nevin. Right, but we just don't have a spot for him at the big league level. I think Kyle Stowers and Taron Vavra as prospects with a bit of a higher pedigree, maybe a higher upside. I think they're going to stay at the big league level. I don't really see how you justify starting either of them at AAA Norfolk. I think the backup first base spot is probably going to be some combination of James McCann, maybe Anthony Santander, maybe Adley Rutschman as well. I think you're fine with that, even if it's not necessarily the platoon that you would have been looking for with Ryan Mountcastle, if James McCann is your usual backup first baseman. I just don't see how Lewin Diaz takes a roster spot from Taron Vavra. And I think that's one of the battles that it's going to come down to. Unless Anthony Santander gets work at first base in spring training, like Rockabaco has said that he will, and the Orioles feel like he's not up to snuff defensively, or they really don't want to use Adley Rutschman at first base, or James McCann... They need him to play more games behind the plate than they do at first base, and they think, boy, we really need a backup first baseman. Then maybe Cordero, Diaz, O'Hearn could earn one of those final roster spots, 
And, of course, injuries are always a possibility. So injuries could knock out one of the players that we have mentioned. However, I will say, do we know that the Orioles really want to go with two extra outfielders? Do you really want to go with McKenna and Stowers when you already have Hayes, Mullins, Santander? Yeah. Or do you feel like we can roll with Stowers and have him play center if we absolutely need to, or have Hayes go over and play center and stick Stowers in the corner, or we'd just rather go with Ryan McKenna? Frankly, I would rather have Kyle Stowers and Ryan McKenna both make this team, and I think that they're both a half step ahead of Taron Vavra, but maybe the Orioles disagree, and they would rather go with a pure backup first baseman than they would either McKenna or Stowers. Yeah, and another element of this conversation that we haven't really mentioned is that we're only really looking at the guys who have either had major league experience or had major league experience with another team like yeah. Diaz, O'Hearn, Franchi Cordero. The Orioles have eight top 100 prospects according to Baseball America. Yeah, big news that came in this morning. Big news from this morning. A few of them, well, a lot of them, seven of the eight have at least played at AAA and a few of them could have legitimate cases to make the opening day roster. I mean, what if you go into spring training and Jordan Westberg just lights the world on fire and now all of a sudden you have to find a place for Jordan Westberg at the big league level? He's played enough games at AAA at this point where if he is just on fire in spring training, I think you have to seriously give Jordan Westberg a look for the opening day roster. You can make the same case for Connor Norby and Joey Ortiz, even though they haven't had as much time at AAA. If they're just good enough to make the team, why wouldn't they make the team? Yeah, and I, I would say, though, the law of averages probably means that if one of those guys lights the world on fire, then somebody else struggles or somebody sure. else gets hurt, and then the problem kind of solves itself and the solution becomes apparent. But there is a reality in which one of those guys breaks out in Sarasota and you need to find a roster spot for him. The Orioles don't necessarily have to for any of those guys, and no. that's the good thing. The only guys that they have to give playing time to are the guys that have established themselves, like a Ryan Mountcastle, like a Ramon Rios, I think you could say, like Jorge Mateo, who has definitely earned his spot on this roster, pretty much regardless of what he does in Sarasota. And then, other than that, you gave it Adam Frazier $8 million. He's got him. He's going to make the team. Right. So... Squeezing those guys in may be a challenge if they are great. By the way, tangentially to discuss those eight prospects, Joey Ortiz made the top 100 for yeah. Baseball America, right? Yeah. He's in the late 90s, mid 90s. He was the 95th ranked prospect in wow. the top 100. Connor Norby comes in at 93. I think when I was evaluating who would be in the top 100, there were the usual six that we assumed would be in there with... Of course, Gunnar Henderson, Grayson Rodriguez yeah. in the top five or six. I think Grayson was the sixth-ranked prospect. Jackson Holiday comes in at 15. You knew Colton Kowser, D.L. Hall, Jordan Westberg were going to be in the top 100. Norby and Ortiz were the big surprises. Yeah. And obviously, in the late 90s, that's not a huge jump into the top 100. But just the fact that they're there is unbelievable. And this is a big league team that won 83 games last year. And you have eight top 100 prospects. Yeah. And I'm Jackson Holiday is the only one who's far away from the bigs. I'm interested to see what MLB Pipeline has for their top 100 because I think they are coming out with a new one soon. Although they did reveal that Grayson Rodriguez is no longer the number one right-handed pitching prospect in baseball. Andrew Painter of the Phillies took that spot from him. Same with Baseball America. Andrew yeah. Painter passes Grayson Rodriguez there as well. Now, Andrew Painter was phenomenal last year, and I think it could be a little bit of recency bias because Grayson Rodriguez missed those two months in the middle of the season, and when he came back, he wasn't as dominant as he was prior to the injury. So had he stayed healthy, I think you could make the case that Grayson Rodriguez would be ahead of him, though had he stayed healthy, Grayson Rodriguez would no longer be a prospect. He would be a full-time big leaguer. Yeah, not worried about that. Yeah, Andrew Painter, a fantastic prospect. He put up really good numbers at the lower levels of the minor leagues. Grayson Rodriguez was dominating everyone at AAA. What the surprised me the most about the Baseball America thing, it's not necessarily that uh, Joey Ortiz and Connor Norby made it. It's that Kobe Mayo didn't. Yeah. I thought Kobe Mayo, and maybe again, this is recency bias similar to Grayson Rodriguez because Kobe Mayo missed some time with injury in the middle of the season. 
But we're talking about a 20, 21-year-old who is in AA, and he wasn't lighting the world on fire, but he was putting up pretty solid numbers. He's got great you know, periphery stats in addition to his counting numbers. He's ahead of the curve age-wise. He still, from what we've heard, plays a solid third base. I would put, personally, Kobe Mayo ahead of somebody like Joey Ortiz, but Joey Ortiz has been phenomenal defensively at all three infield positions and has performed better at the plate than I think you could reasonably expect. Yeah, I mean, Joey Ortiz just flat out put up better numbers last year. Joey Ortiz was absolutely mashing once he got fully healthy last season. And like you said, Kobe Mayo still put up a pretty good year based on his age and his level and all of those things. But Kobe Mayo just didn't put up the kind of numbers that Joey Ortiz did. I think once we hit like the mid-season rankings for Baseball America's Top 100, I think it's entirely possible that Kobe Mayo is in that Top 100, but he just didn't put up the kind of numbers that somebody like Ortiz did. And as we're getting some comments about some starting pitchers and some potential trades, I think it's also really interesting to look at. There are, what, five of the eight prospects in the Top 100 for the Orioles are infielders. Yeah. The Orioles have a lot of depth at either the AAA or the Major League level in the infield. People keep bringing up the Marlins as well. They just traded Miguel Rojas to the Dodgers. Could they be a team that is looking for a middle infielder from the Orioles in exchange for a starting pitcher? It's the team that we keep tossing out as a trade possibility. I think having so many top 100 prospects that are middle infielders just gives you even more justification that the Orioles have a ton of depth to work with. I mean, you could trade a Jordan Westberg or a Joey Ortiz or a Connor Norby to the Marlins for a pitcher and still be totally fine in the middle infield. Yeah, I think teams are looking at, I'm just guessing, I'm not plugged into all the front offices around baseball. The way that we're looking at the Marlins right now and saying there's no way that they can go into the 2023 season. They have nine starting pitchers. With that many starting pitchers. Yeah. That many good young pitchers. I would hazard to guess that other teams are looking at the Orioles and saying there's no way they can go into 2023 with that many infielders slash infield prospects. Yeah. The glut that the Marlins have at pitching matches what the Orioles have in terms of infield. Because what are you going to do in the middle of the season when Joey Ortiz, Jordan Westberg, and Connor Norby are ready to go? And then all of a sudden you have three top 100 prospects in your middle infield and not many places to put them because you have Gunnar Henderson, Ramon Arias, Adam Frazier. Again, that's probably a conversation that'll work itself out, whether it's through trades or through injuries. It seems like in the offseason, we always have these kinds of conversations about how playing time will work out, and then it just kind of does through one reason or another. But the Orioles are absolutely loaded in the middle infield. The issue is, and the minefield of this is, you don't want to trade the wrong one. Yes. You don't want to trade Jordan Westberg and he turns out to be a star. You don't want to trade Joey Ortiz and he turns out to be a gold glover. You want to make sure that you're trading the right one and that you are keeping the guys in-house that have the best potential to be the best going forward. That's very difficult to do when none of these guys have played in the big leagues yet. So you don't want to look foolish because you trade the wrong one when all of these guys are seemingly on equal footing at this point. And I think the Marlins are probably worried about the same thing. I mean, they have Trevor Rogers, Jesus Lazardo, Braxton Garrett, Edward Cabrera, who are all entering their age 25 season. They don't want to trade the wrong one either. Yeah. You don't want to go ahead and trade Edward Cabrera, and then he turns out to be a multiple-time All-Star, and the guys that you have in-house aren't as good as Edward Cabrera. Yeah, and then that's not even taking into account, I mean, Max Meyer. They have another yeah. top 10 pitching prospect in baseball. They just signed Johnny Cueto. I mean, they're all over the place. I saw one comment as well on YouTube. Why do the Orioles seem to have soured on D.L. Hall? I don't think the Orioles have soured on D.L. Hall. I think that D.L. Hall is not as far along in his progression as Grayson Rodriguez, and I think that By comparison, he struggles when you compare him to what Grayson Rodriguez has done. But Grayson Rodriguez has been way better at this point in his young career than we could have expected. And also, D.L. Hall didn't correct the things that he needed to last year to get over the hump. 
Yeah. He, he didn't have a disastrous 2022, but he didn't have a great one. He had a four plus, four and a half ERA in AAA Norfolk. You were hoping that he was going to be great in AAA Norfolk. You were hoping he was going to have a two and a half ERA like Grayson Rodriguez did. And then when he got called up to the big leagues, he had about a five and a half ERA, and the Orioles were never comfortable with using him in the rotation. And it's not just the Orioles that have adjusted their expectations of D.L. Hall. Look at the MLB uh, top 100 prospects according to Baseball America. He has dipped a lot farther, further than he was a year or two ago. Yeah, he's, he's just, number 75 on that list. Whereas a year ago, I, would, I don't know off the top of my head, but I think he was higher than that. And yeah. I think MLB Pipeline has consistently dropped D.L. Hall down. MLB Pipeline still has D.L. Hall as the number four left-handed pitching prospect in baseball. So he is still, again, this is still a top 75 prospect in baseball, still a top five left-handed pitching prospect in baseball. I don't think by any means the Orioles have given up on D.L. Hall by any stretch. Like you said, Paul, they just didn't really see the things from him last year that they needed to see. If he was excellent at the back half of last year, if he was good in his first career start or if he had made another start and was still solid, then we would be penciling D.L. Hall into the starting rotation and trying to figure out how the Orioles are going to work around having both Grayson Rodriguez and D.L. Hall in the starting rotation with Kyle Bradish and Dean Kramer, Kyle Gibson, where does Tyler Wells go? That's the conversation we would be having. But as of right now, D.L. Hall is probably going to be in the bullpen. Not that the Orioles have given up on him as a starting pitcher, but if you see enough from D.L. Hall out of the bullpen where he's throwing three, four scoreless innings, then you figure out where to put him in the starting rotation. It's just a matter, I don't think it's a matter of if at this point. I still think it's a matter of when D.L. Hall makes this starting rotation. It's just not yet. They need to see more. Yeah. Good transition, though. I thought so. To the bullpen. Yeah. Let's talk about the bullpen because the Orioles bolstered their bullpen by acquiring lefty Darwinson Hernandez from the Boston Red Sox in exchange for cash considerations. He would strike out huge walk guy. Yeah. Over the course of his career, 14 Ks per nine and almost eight walks per nine. In 91 career games, only one career start, and an ERA a tick over five was very good, solid in 2021. 338 ERA coming out of the bullpen for the Red Sox, but he really struggled in 2022. 16 earned runs in just six and two thirds, and also wasn't great in AAA. Had a 573 ERA in 33 innings at AAA. The upside is there for Darwinson Hernandez. But the reason the Orioles were able to acquire him for the low, low price of cash considerations is because he is coming off a pretty nightmarish 2022 season. Yeah, there's definitely upside. It kind of reminds me of claiming a guy like Jorge Mateo, who was one of the top prospects in the past, and you know the pedigree was there, and you're just hoping that something pans out. Darwin's in Hernandez was a top five prospect in the Red Sox system as recently as 2019, he was their fourth-ranked prospect. So there is still a lot to work with there with Darwin and Hernandez. You mentioned the unbelievable strikeout numbers and the really, really bad walk numbers. Felix Bautista had awful walk numbers in his minor league career. And if you want a, a prime example of somebody that Darwin and Hernandez has the potential to turn into, you could look at somebody like CNL Perez. And Darwin and Hernandez, as you mentioned, Paul, 7.7 walks per nine in his career. And you're probably thinking, oh, Brandon and Paul, that's a ridiculous number. Surely nobody can come back from that. In 2021, CNL Perez walked seven and a half batters per nine innings with the Cincinnati Reds. And then he comes to the Orioles and has a sub two ERA and walks like three and a half guys per nine. It's the possible. Orioles can figure things out with these bullpen arms. They have a track record yes. of doing it, and I'm glad you compared him to Perez, who is a lefty. The The better comparison is to Perez, not to Bautista, because he doesn't have, Darwinson Hernandez doesn't have triple-digit fastball stuff. He is not going to blow you away with his fastball. He can hit 95-96, but he's not going to, he, he, he's not that electric. Right. However, 14 strikeouts per nine is nothing to sneeze at. So he's a lefty that the Orioles are acquiring for their bullpen. And we've said before, I think if you were to poll Orioles fans as the offseason was starting back in the beginning of October and they were to rank the areas of need on the Orioles, they would probably put bullpen either last or near the bottom because of how good the bullpen was last year. 
But that bullpen looks primed for regression. And I think what the Orioles are doing by loading up on bullpen arms is ensuring that it doesn't regress. Yes. You look at the lefties that they have in their bullpen right now with CNL Perez. They have Nick Vespi, though he had sports hernia surgery, and the Orioles said he's going to return if everything goes well the early part of the season, so he's likely to miss opening day. You add, you have Keegan Aiken, who's a lefty. You add Darwin's and Hernandez. You have Michael Gibbons in the bullpen now. You have guys in the bullpen that have been very good and a lot of guys that had great 2022 seasons. But the question is, is it repeatable? And CNL Perez, as good as he was last year, I think you could make a reasonable case that he will come back down to earth a little bit next year. Yeah, I think as fun as that bullpen was last year, it was still incredibly surprising. Yeah. And there are reasons to look at the 2023 season and just assume that these guys are not going to have those gaudy numbers. I mean, CNL Perez, I think, is a good bullpen arm. Do I think he's a sub-2 ERA bullpen arm? Probably not. He was last year, but... Right, but... but prior to that, he was a 6 ERA guy. Chances are he is not going to have a sub-2 ERA again. Yeah. I think Felix Bautista has a chance to be a good closer in this league. Is he going to pitch like a top-10 reliever in all of baseball? I don't know. I mean, he looked like he could have been last year, but it's hard without the track record to repeat that kind of success. And maybe Perez and Bautista will both come out next year and do very similar things, in which case we would be looking at their third seasons in 2024 and saying, oh yeah, they can repeat this. They have shown that they were able to. But Bautista and Perez especially, we're kind of singling them out because they had two of the better numbers in the Orioles' bullpen last year. We don't know if they can repeat that yeah. because in their previous seasons, they just weren't all that good. I think if you're looking at one bullpen arm that is a little bit more of a sure thing to repeat their 2022, I would say Dylan Tate yeah. because he has a better track record. And then they bring in Michael Givens, who may I won't say he becomes the best arm in this bullpen, but he might be the most reliable. Yeah. If you're asking me to put money on somebody who's going to have a good 2023 again, I would probably say Michael Givens. I think he's the closest thing to a sure thing in this bullpen right now. Relievers are year to year, regardless of their track record. Sometimes you yeah. see guys who look like annual all-stars and they can't repeat their success. Look at what happened to Josh Hader when he got traded. It happens to closers. It happens to relievers across baseball. And they could be excellent, talented relievers, but because of the short outings that they use, because of confidence, whatever it is, relievers are year to year. And not only do you have that volatility, but now you add the volatility of this Orioles bullpen is not very proven, and you could have a recipe for disaster if you were rolling into the season with exactly the same guys and saying, we expect as good a season from Felix Bautista, from Keegan Aiken, from Dylan Tate, from CNL Perez, from Joey Crable, from Brian Baker, all of those guys had career years last year. Every guy that I mentioned there. So it's not likely that each one of those guys is as good next year as they were this year. And by adding these sure things, I mean, Michael Gibbons may not have the highest ceiling, but it's hard to find somebody who consistently has a 3-3 or 3-4 ERA every year. It's still a really good pitcher. And his durability, his consistency, is it's hard to find. And that is certainly a trait that he possesses. So when you look at all the guys that they've amassed now in their bullpen, they have Bautista, they have CNL Perez, they add Michael Gibbons, they have Keegan Aiken, they have Dylan Tate, they have Darwin's and Hernandez now, they have Joey Crable, they've got Andrew Politi, the Rule 5 draft pick. Yeah. They've got Brian Baker. They've got Nick Vespi, who should come back early in the season. You're naming a lot of guys. They've got Logan Gillespie. They've got D.L. Hall. Yeah. Who is going to make this team? That's a good question, Paul, and I'm so glad you asked. I broke this down into a whole bunch of different categories. My first category is the absolute locks, and I think there are four of them. The four absolute locks that I have, Felix Bautista, Dylan Tate, Michael Givens, CNL Perez. 
That's four absolute locks. Sure, I agree. There's one more pretty much a lock. Who's Brian Baker? Yep. That's five. My next category is you probably need a lefty innings eater, and that's Keegan Aiken. Okay. I like it. My probably need a righty innings eater is Austin Voth. Those are two different categories there. My next category (laughs) is he's got to be somewhere, and that's D.L. Hall. Okay. Because I'm not 100% sure if he's going to be in the bullpen. I think there is an off chance he makes the starting rotation if there is an injury or if D.L. Hall is just unbelievable in spring training. I think there's an off chance he makes the starting rotation. I'm not giving it a high percent chance, so I'm putting D.L. Hall in the bullpen for now. And that's pretty much the bullpen. It's funny that you mentioned those eight guys as well. Because yeah. That is my projected bullpen as well. Would you Brendan? look at that? Great minds. Think alike. Sure. Those are the eight guys that I would have. Now, if you're going with the 26-man roster on opening day, you got 13 pitchers, 13 position players, your five starters, let's say probably going to be Grayson Rodriguez, Dean Kramer, Kyle Gibson, Tyler Wells, uh, and who am I missing here? Say that again. Dean Kramer, Kyle, <laughs> Dean Kramer, Grayson Rodriguez. Yeah. Kyle Gibson, Tyler Wells. Kyle Bradish. Kyle Bradish. So those are your five starters. Yep. So now you're talking about these eight relievers, and I have those same eight, Brendan. I've got Felix Bautista, CNL Perez, Michael Gibbons, Dylan Tate, Brian Baker, DL Hall, Austin Voth, Keegan Aiken. Now I do think for those last three spots that there is a chance that somebody unseats DL Hall, Austin Voth, or Keegan Aiken. I think that there's a chance, I don't think it's very high, but there's a chance that the Orioles decide we're committed to making DL Hall a starter. We're going to send him back down to AAA Norfolk, and he's going to start games for us there until he's ready to come up. I think that there's a chance Keegan Aiken doesn't make this team because the Orioles don't believe his success is repeatable, and they don't think that he's has a high enough ceiling, and he all he's going to be for you is an innings eater, and they'd rather use that spot on somebody else. Austin Voth, I think, has a good chance of making this team because of how good he was last year, because they're going to be paying him over a million dollars, depending on what they settle for, either in arbitration or prior to arbitration. And he's out of options. So he's got to make this team or he's going to be cut. Andrew Polite is a Rule 5 draft pick. If he doesn't make this team, he's got to be sent back to the Boston Red Sox. So the last couple spots, I think you could say, are up for grabs. And spring training is six weeks long. A lot can change in those six weeks. And maybe there's somebody that we're not discussing. If you noticed in those eight, we also didn't have Darwin's and Hernandez. Maybe Darwin's and Hernandez is phenomenal in spring training, and you can't keep him off the opening day roster. Yeah, so one scenario that I'll throw at you here, Paul, is let's say D.L. Hall starts the year in the bullpen, and then all of a sudden he jumps from my he's got to be somewhere category to my lefty innings eater category, right? In which case, you have two guys in D.L. Hall and Keegan Aiken who fill very similar roles where they can give you two, three, four innings at a time. They're not pitching every day, but they can maybe pitch every three or four days and they give you just innings relief when you need it. If D.L. Hall starts the year in the bullpen and makes that team, does Keegan Aiken then become redundant? Do you need two of those guys? I would argue that maybe you don't and maybe you would opt for somebody like Darwin's and Hernandez who is probably going to give you a little bit of shorter stints here and there. I know Darwinson Hernandez also has the capability to start. Maybe he would fill that similar role as well. But I would imagine that the plan for Darwinson Hernandez is to get him to a little bit of a shorter inning stint. Maybe it's an inning or two. And maybe his strikeout numbers are just better than those of Keegan Aiken. Maybe he shows you something in spring training. And the Orioles say, hey, we don't need both D.L. Hall and Keegan Aiken in this bullpen filling very similar roles, but we want to keep another lefty. Let's opt for Darwin's and Hernandez instead of Keegan Aiken. That's kind of my dark horse theory. And we're also assuming that the Orioles are more likely to go with five righties and three lefties in that bullpen. Yeah. And that each lefty has to take another lefty spot so that there can only be one Keegan Aiken, Darwin's and Hernandez, D.L. Hall, or there can only be two of those three. But maybe the Orioles really feel like to start the year, they would rather go with four and four. The only kind of difficulty is when a guy is out of options, like Austin Voth. Because 
the, we talk every spring about how the opening day roster is just that. It is just the roster on the first day of the season, and you can move guys in and out from then on. I mean, you within the first week, you can make a million different roster moves and change your roster entirely, and your opening day lineup looks nothing like it was a, you know, a week later. But when a guy is out of options like Austin Voth, that makes it a lot more difficult. So the Orioles, for all these guys that have options, and this is why it's big that Darwinson Hernandez has options left, they could start Darwinson Hernandez down in AAA and have Keegan Aiken make this team, and then a week later say, nah, Keegan yeah. Aiken, head back down to Norfolk, and uh, welcome to the big leagues, Darwinson Hernandez. Yeah, they, this, can, they can mix and match. This isn't even including including a few guys who were good last year. Yeah. I mean, Joey Crable put up pretty good numbers last yeah. season, and neither of us have him making this bullpen. There are a few kind of younger, exciting guys. Noah oh. Denoyer just made this roster, the 40-man roster, not yeah. the opening day roster. He's a possibility. Logan Gillespie made the 40-man roster last year. He's Mike, a possibility. Mike Bauman is still out there? Mike Bauman is still out there. Nick Vespi just underwent surgery, so we don't know what his timetable looks like early in, the in season, terms of his injury. Early in the season, so Nick Vespi is a possibility. You mentioned some of the guys who maybe profile as emergency starters if they're just hanging out in AAA Norfolk and you need them, but you've got Mike Bauman, Spencer Watkins, Bruce Zimmerman. I think those are probably guys that are going to be in AAA Norfolk, but then maybe get called up if there's an injury. There's there's a lot of potential names that could make this bullpen. Yeah. How many spot starters would you prefer to have? You know, Austin Both is probably your ideal spot starter. Spencer Watkins, like you said, could be a, an ideal spot starter. But do you really want to hide him in the bullpen and have him come out of the bullpen until he gets his opportunity? Some comment I just saw on Facebook, where's John Means? He's hurt. Uh, he's not coming back. He's, until he had Tommy John. Tommy John. It's going to take a little while. But <laughs> he should July. Probably, he'll probably be back middle of the season, yeah. hopefully, if things go well. Yep, that'll, uh, that'll work itself but out. But he's certainly not in the bullpen. No. So the Orioles, while they haven't addressed starting pitcher as much as we expected they would this offseason, and maybe there's yet a move to be made, they are loading up in the bullpen in order to lengthen their start, their pitching depth. Yes. Brendan, let's talk about the international signing period. Let's do it. The Orioles went out and added 27 international amateur free agents on the first day of the international signing period. That's a whole bunch. That is a lot. Orioles Senior Director of International Scouting, Kobe Perez, has really taken this bull by the horns and has gone out and dominated, I think you could say, <laughs> has certainly built a strong pipeline that didn't exist three, four years ago. Yeah, I think just in general, we'll talk about Luis Almeida, who kind of highlights this international class, but in general, the takeaway here is just that it's exciting that the Orioles are actually, actually active in this market. Yeah. I mean, we have seen so many teams around baseball that are built around superstars that they have gotten on the international market. I mean, just look at the Atlanta Braves. They have signed guys like Ozzy Albies and Ronald Acuna, and that is how they have built the core of their team. And for the Orioles, not that your best players had to come from the international market. We're not asking for them to go to zero to 100 in a year, but you're signing guys that are now entering your top 30 prospects in yeah. the system. The Orioles have, what, four international signings in MLB Pipeline's top 30? as of right now, highlighted by Samuel Basayo, who's a top 15 prospect in the system right now. They have five. Five now? Yeah. it's we'll Oh, Cesar Prieto as well. He's yeah. just older, so I almost don't consider him part of that class. But he, he was part of that class as well, just a lot closer to the big leagues than the other ones were. Yeah, and when I say dominated, I don't mean that he's produced the best international apartment in all of baseball yet. But to put the Orioles this close to the top... And this close to the cream of the crop, when you talk about signing and developing international talent in such a short amount of time, it's not everybody can do that. It's yeah. difficult to do. And he has put the Orioles solidly, at least in the middle of the pack, and I would say in the probably the top third in terms of signing and uh, now investing in the international department. And as the Orioles continue to improve and their record continues to improve, they're not going to have as many high first-round draft picks. I mean, yeah. Jackson Holiday was the number one overall pick. The Orioles, hopefully, if if everything goes to plan, will not be picking that high 
in the amateur college draft. And the Orioles maybe will be getting some of their better prospects through this international signing period because they won't be getting as many top five prospects in baseball as we're seeing. So this class of 27 tied for the franchise record for largest class to open a free agency international free agency they did it in 2019 2020 remember they opted for quantity then as they were just beginning to build their international department they signed nine pitchers and eight infielders six catchers and four outfielders 14 came from the dominican republic 11 from venezuela and one each from colombia and cuba and the jewel of this class brendan is luis almeida 16 years old doesn't turn 17 until april he was the 20th ranked international free agent, according to MLB Pipeline, number 17, according to Baseball America. And he signed the most lucrative deal in international free agency in Orioles history. $2.3 million. Fascinating story. Grew up in New Jersey, moved down to the Dominican Republic at age 15 because his grandmother had Alzheimer's and his family wanted to be closer to her. Spent some time in Mexico learning about playing over playing not overseas but playing in a different country and according to Kobe Perez he's going to spend some time in the United States playing this year probably my guess would be the Florida Complex League I don't know if they'll start him there and then they'll move him back down to DSL I don't know if they're going to start him in DSL and move him up it's going to depend on what they see when they get their hands on him and how he looks come February and March but a fascinating case because he is fully ingrained in American culture. A lot of these kids, part of the reason you build a Dominican Academy uh, a Dominican Academy, is that you want to get these guys up to speed on American culture and what American baseball is like, have them try to learn some English as well. He's already got all that under his belt. Yeah. So he is more advanced for his age than some of the other guys that he was signed with. Yeah, and it's interesting, too. I mean, if you haven't seen his introductory press conference, you should. It's it, He seems like a great kid. He does. It's interesting when you look at the international class. Cesar Prieto being an example, somebody who was a little bit older, a very advanced hitter, but he started in the U.S. playing professional ball, and a lot of the acclimation for these guys, as you mentioned, is just getting acclimated to the culture in the U.S., and there's very often a language barrier when you're playing with a lot of teammates who grew up in the United States. It's it's hard to get past that that language barrier, that culture barrier. And it's interesting that Almeida, as an international signing, isn't really going to have that once yeah. he starts playing in the United States. So it's a really interesting case, and I'm, I'm really interested to see what he does when he is in the U.S. because he doesn't have a lot of those same hurdles as some other international prospects might have. The Orioles also highlighted six other guys, three from the Dominican Republic and three from Venezuela. Shortstop Joshua Lorenzo, 16 from the DR. Infielder Jose Mejia, 17 from the Dominican Republic. Probably profiles as a second baseman, they said. Shortstop Felix Amparo from the Dominican Republic. A righty, Keeler Morfe, who's 16 from Venezuela. Shortstop, Luis Guevara, who's 16 from Venezuela. And Francisco Morao from Venezuela, as well, a 17-year-old lefty. So they highlighted those specific players. And I know what you're thinking. We hear about these guys every international signing period, and then they fall off the radar. And then we don't talk about them ever again until they come up to the United States and until they're at Delmarva and Aberdeen and they're really performing well. So I also wanted to follow up on some of the recent international signees because we mentioned their names on previous podcasts, but you're probably wondering what happened to them, and sometimes it's difficult to find that kind of information. Let's go back to when Kobe Perez took over in 2019-2020 when they had 27 signees. Now, only six of those guys have reached low single-A Delmarve. 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 Uh, righty Moises Chase. Uh, righty Raul Rangel. Harold Arias, who's also a righty. Righty Edgar Portes. Righty Rander, Randy Berguete. And righty Alejandro Mendez. I probably butchered all those names. But six righties made it up to low single-A Delmarva. Again, that class did not have any top 50 prospects. That class was mostly about building the depth. Right. And that was the first step in what is hopefully going to become one of the better international departments around baseball. I would say don't look at their stats. 
They haven't been particularly good in the United States, but they were establishing their foothold in the market as well. And then one of the guys in that class was Luis de la Cruz, who was traded to the Mets for James McCann. Yeah. So it's already showing, already paying dividends in that one guy became a player to be named later in a trade that got a big leaguer. Yeah, and then over the last few seasons, there are some big highlights. Samuel Basayo and Michael Hernandez were in the next class. Both of those guys are top 30 prospects. According to MLB Pipeline, Samuel Basayo has played a little bit better so far. He is the second best catcher in the Orioles system right now, you could probably say. Of course, behind Abby Rutschman, at least in terms of having a high ceiling. Still a long way away, but some really encouraging signs from Basayo. Michael Hernandez is a fun young shortstop. He has five tool potential. He's a he's big. I think he's like six three. He's very fluid at shortstop. Really exciting prospect. And then last year, you bring in Braylon Tavera and Leandro Arias. Leandro Arias are the two names that I was thinking of. And then kind of late, you get Cesar Prieto, who was the very advanced hitter from Cuba. You bring him in. He's a little bit older. He's already up to double ba- double A buoy. And he has shown a ton of promise. He struggled a little bit with the Bay Sox. But again, it's hard to tell what the level of competition in Cuba was as compared to maybe a minor league system. So Prieto had a few road bumps with the Bay Sox, but this could be a dude. I mean, Cesar Prieto has shown a ton of promise in the minor league system. I think the Orioles are really happy with the progress that he showed last year. And Kobe Perez also said, on the Orioles Hot Stove Show, which airs every Friday at 9 p.m. on Mass and Brendan, mm. that Cesar Prieto had never played a season that long. So yeah. by the end of the season, they were noticing some signs of fatigue. So that could be something that he improves upon next year and he is able to play deeper into August and September and play better as the season goes along because that's when he really struggled. It was, wasn't was just the jump up to double-A boo. It was probably the length of the season as well for Cesar Prieto. A couple other guys that the Orioles highlighted last year would be Edwin Amparo and Thomas Sosa. You're talking about five guys between Samuel Basayo, Michael Hernandez, Cesar Prieto, Leandro Arias, and Braylon Tavera in the top 30 of the Orioles system. Basayo's number 12, Prieto's number 18, and then you've got Michael Hernandez, 27, Braylon Tavera, 28, and Leandro Arias, 29. I think that this... When we get the new Orioles top 30 in a couple weeks or a month or so from MLB Pipeline, I think that we're going to see Luis Almeida make the Orioles top 30. Yeah. I think that he probably could make the Orioles top 20, considering he signed for a higher dollar amount than anybody else in Orioles history. Yeah. 2.3 million. Yeah, I think it's possible that maybe it's still around five international prospects because maybe if Luis Almeida makes the top 30, then he bumps somebody like Leandro Arias out of the top 30. But still really exciting that you have gone from having zero international prospects in your top 30 just a few years ago to now you have five, maybe six guys in there. Yeah, exciting stuff. And like we said, not every guy is going to reach the United States or reach the upper levels of the organization, but they become great trade pieces if you need to use them. Yep. Uh, And they simply improve the depth across all levels of the organization, which is something that the Orioles have made their priority since Michael Elias took over. Yeah. Brendan just about does it for our Mass and All Access podcast today. At Brendan Morty is his Twitter handle. I am at Paul Mancano. Spring training is less than a month away. Whew. Can you believe it? No. Where did the offseason go? Couldn't tell you. Pitchers and catchers report to Sarasota, Florida on February 15th. Ooh. Wow. Exciting stuff. Very exciting. Uh, you can catch the Mass and All Access podcast on any of your favorite pop podcast platforms, Spotify, SoundCloud. Watch every week, every Wednesday at 11 a.m. on Facebook and on YouTube. Watch After the Fact on the Masson app as well and on MassonSports.com. Thanks so much to Amy Jennings for producing this podcast. For Brenda Mortensen, I'm Paul Mancano. We'll catch you next time.